Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to remote access in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the final fourth of four videos for Domain 4. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Ah, 2020. It started with such promise, and then COVID hit and upended our lives. So many of our well-established routines drastically changed. For those of us that were fortunate enough to keep our jobs, many of us switched from working in the office to working from home. And thankfully, we had many excellent protocols and systems that allow us to securely connect to remote corporate networks and remain highly productive working from home. We're going to go through the major protocols that allow us to establish tunnels, encrypt those tunnels, and create VPNs, perform remote authentication, and remote management of systems. Let's start with the concept of tunneling, which is encapsulating an entire packet within the data portion of another packet. Tunneling allows us to do some very useful things, such as connecting private networks together across a public network like the internet. Recall the IP addresses we tend to use on private networks, for example, the 10.0 IP addresses are not routable across the public internet. Thus with tunneling, we can take a packet that has a private IP destination address and encapsulate that packet within another packet that has a public destination IP address. Tunneling basically means adding a new header to a packet. We can also encapsulate foreign protocols to run over a network that does not support that particular protocol. For example, sending IP version 6 packets across an IP version 4 network. There are three major tunneling protocols that you should know about, and we'll start with GRE, Generic Routing Encapsulation, which is a simple tunneling protocol that can encapsulate a wide variety of network protocols and create point-to-point -point connections essentially allowing you to easily connect two networks together and pass traffic back and forth between those networks across a third network, typically the internet. PPTP, point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, is an obsolete tunneling protocol with many well-known security vulnerabilities. PPTP by itself does not provide encryption and authentication and must be used in combination with other protocols to create VPNs. More on what a VPN is in just a moment. L2TP, layer two tunneling protocol, is a successor to PPTP. And L2TP includes many improvements, such as the ability to encrypt its control messages. But very importantly, L2TP on its own does not encrypt the data portion of a packet. Why is it so important to encrypt the data portion of a packet when sending that data through a tunnel? As we've discussed, tunnels are typically used to connect two private networks together over the public internet, or to connect a remote device like a laptop to a corporate network, again, across the public internet. And you should always assume that someone, probably multiple someones, are inspecting your data that transits the internet. Therefore, from a security perspective, it is very important to encrypt the data that is being sent through a tunnel to provide confidentiality. And that is a VPN. A virtual private network is an encrypted tunnel where the data that is sent through the tunnel is encrypted. Let's now talk through the major VPN protocols that you need to know about. And we'll start with the protocol that you need to know the most about, IPsec, IP security, is a standardized suite of protocols that which work together and allow a massive degree of flexibility in how IPsec can be configured to create a VPN. The first choice you have when establishing an IPsec connection is choosing either authentication header mode, which provides only integrity, data origin authentication, and replay protection, or encapsulating security payload, which provides everything in AH plus confidentiality by encrypting the data portion of the payload. So technically, IPsec in AH mode is just a tunnel, while IPsec in ESP mode is a VPN because it provides an encrypted tunnel. The next choice you have is to run IPsec in either transport mode, which means the original packet header is reused, or tunnel mode, which means a new header is created encapsulating the original packet header and payload. 
Here's a two by two matrix showing you a simplified view of how these different modes fit together. Hopefully this makes these different modes a little easier to understand. Another part of IPsec is IKE, Internet Key Exchange, which is the protocol used to establish security associations. What are security associations, I hear you asking? They are a simplex establishment of attributes such as the authentication algorithm, encryption algorithm, and encryption keys to be used when establishing a connection. Think of it this way. When an IPsec connection is established, a bunch of negotiations and agreements need to occur. The client and the server, or more generalized, two entities, need to authenticate each other using, say, X509 digital certificates and exchange symmetric encryption keys using, say, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. To allow these two entities to do all this, they first need to agree on what authentication algorithm they're going to use, and what encryption algorithm, and what IPsec mode. This is the purpose of security associations, to agree on and establish these attributes. And that word simplex means that SAs only allow communication in one direction. So to establish a tunnel where two entities can talk back and forth, you need two security associations, one for each direction. And if you want to add encryption in both directions, you need two more SAs. A total of four security associations are required to establish an IPsec VPN. Next up, another protocol commonly used for establishing VPNs, SSL TLS. Let's start with naming and versions. SSL, Secure Socket Layer, was the name of the protocol for the first three major versions. The protocol was then renamed Transport Layer Security, TLS, to better reflect that it operates at Layer 4, the transport layer of the OSI model. So SSL TLS are the same protocol, and TLS is just the name of the most recent versions. TLS was primarily created to authenticate and encrypt the connection between a web browser and a web server, but it can also be used to secure other types of connections and allow you to create, say, a VPN. It's important to understand the steps that are required to establish a TLS connection. First, the client sends a client hello message, which tells the server which version of TLS the client supports and which encryption algorithms. Second, the server then responds with a server hello message. And very importantly, the server hello message includes a copy of the server's digital certificate. Step three, the client decrypts the server's digital certificate, allowing the client to authenticate the server, confirm the server is in fact, say, amazon.com and not sketchyhacker.com. As part of step three, the client generates a new symmetric encryption key, also known as a session key, and encrypts this symmetric key with the server's public key obtained from the server's digital certificate. Step four, the client sends the encrypted session key over to the server and the server decrypts with the server's private key. And now both the client and the server have the same symmetric session key. They can efficiently encrypt data and they can send that data back and forth, thus creating a secure encrypted connection. I created a video, which I've linked to above, on digital certificates, where I talk in a little more detail about how they are used in the TLS protocol. One final piece I'll mention here related to TLS is that in the initial client hello message, the client can send the client's certificate to the server, allowing the server to authenticate the client, thus allowing mutual authentication. The client and server can both authenticate each other. And in fact, you can even run SSL TLS in a mode referred to as unencrypted SSL, where an encrypted connection is not required, but authentication is required. A couple of other protocols you should recognize as VPN protocols, SOX, Socket Secure Protocol, which operates at layer five, the session layer, and SSH, Secure Shell Protocol, which operates at layer seven, the application layer. Next up, remote authentication. Let's say it's 1995 and you're running a hell of fly dial-up internet service with a few thousand customers. You need some way to authenticate your users authorize them and account for their usage of your service. Enter RADIUS, a protocol originally designed to do just that, remote authentication dial-up in user service. RADIUS is a protocol that allows a user to connect to and access network resources 
and the protocol provides authentication, authorization, and accounting, AAA. TACAX Plus, and this is a heck of a name, Terminal Access Controller Access Control System Plus does the same job as Radius with the improvement that TACAX encrypts the full contents of the packets it transmits versus Radius, which just poorly obfuscates the user's password. And Diameter is the successor to Radius. Diameter adds some good security features such as EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, for much more secure and robust authentication of users. Final topic, remote access management. Networks have grown ever larger over the years, with network devices like firewalls, routers, switches, and servers spreading all over a building, across multiple buildings, or even across multiple countries. We need protocols to allow us to remotely connect to these network devices and administer them, check in on the status of the device, and make configuration changes. SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, allows you to collect all sorts of information from network devices in real time, including performance metrics, alerts, and the specific configuration of a device. And well beyond just monitoring, you can further send commands to reconfigure a device. SNMP is a powerful protocol. I like to remember SNMP as standing for security's not my problem, as the first couple of versions of SNMP are a total dumpster fire from a security perspective. SNMP version 1 sends passwords in clear text. <laughs> SNMP version 2 is a slight improvement as it allows password hashing, but not by default. Version 3 is a huge improvement from a security perspective. So if you're using SNMP, make sure it, it is version 3. And finally, Telnet, which is a protocol that allows you to remotely connect to a network device, like a server, and get a command line interface access. And that is an overview of remote access within Domain 4, covering the most critical concepts to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I will provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and all the best in your studies.